Hi everyone, Brian here wishing you a great Monday and a wonderful week ahead. We've been looking at all of Scripture through the lens of uh, belief in and support for the reality of the human soul as a dynamic aspect of what it means to be a whole religious person. And we've been talking about the Bible as a resource, yes, for understanding the history of the people of God, yes, for understanding how that people understood God and what God was asking of us as a covenant people or through Jesus Christ. Uh, but we also have been looking at scripture and most particularly in this series as a, a book that reflects to us both the writers and the figures they're talking about as trusting in the reality that there is a human soul at the core of our being, that that soul uh, gives us an intense experience of the vitality of life, the zing and zestfulness of life, the meaning and significance of life, the beauty and joy of life, and that life has, uh, as Jesus uh, referred to it, and as we hear in the Revelation to John, an alpha and an omega, which is to say our souls transcend the concrete experience of our everyday lives and connect us to a great spirit that flows not just through human beings and, and the history of this planet, but through the entire cosmos uh, from the moment of Big Bang onwards and it connects us to the creative energy that is the author of this uh, universe towards that author's intended co conclusion, the Alpha and the Omega. Uh, and so we've been watching this and seeing it in lots of figures uh, throughout the Hebrew Scriptures. We could have spent much more time and looked at a great many more figures and seeing the same rhythm repeated over and over again. First, God uh, wants us to know, bubbling up, that God is with us, that life is as God intended it, and is um, all right, that all will be well. Secondly, that God invites us to understand the divine nature which is always surprising and which sometimes has to unglue us from presuppositions that are deeply and often piously held by us. But nevertheless, uh, God gradually nurtures us to accept these uh, new ideas and uh, new ways of comprehending the divine at work in the world. And then uh, thirdly, the nurturance of the soul to send us back into the world uh, with this renewed comprehension of who we are and how God is at work in order to participate in that spiritual energy and, and see the world um, as a place of service and sacrifice on our part, just as the world is an opportunity for service and sacrifice on the divine part. And that's what I'd like to talk about today. We are looking at a variety of uh, figures now from the New Testament. But before we can really go too far into New Testament writings and even New Testament personalities, we have to recognize that every New Testament writer saw something extraordinary and experienced in themselves a response to that extraordinary in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. And that's what they're trying to get across to us in everything they write in the New Testament. It may sound like history, it may sound like theology, and even from my perspective, it may sound like wisdom to show us the soul, but absolutely every little bit of ink that was at the end of a quill onto whatever parchment they were writing originally the letters, uh, Gospels, and other writings of the New Testament, uh, every drop of that ink was there to express to future generations the experience of those who knew and interacted with Jesus in the first generation of uh, the Christian church. 
they felt themselves uh, utterly transcended and transformed as human beings. Uh, to varying degrees, of course, but experiencing the world in a radically new way. And even if they weren't 100% there themselves, they tasted it enough to know that the, the absolute saints among them, and there were many, uh, uh, who en just encapsulated within themselves this Christness. Uh, the first generation of Christians uh, knew that it was there and available to anyone, anytime. It's an extraordinary thing. And it was all centered on their experience of this uh, roving rabbi, Jesus from the town of Nazareth and Galilee. So <clears throat> we want to be able to talk about who and what Christ is because they are very clear. Take uh, Mark's gospel, for example. Uh, and I can actually turn there right now because I just want to make sure that I give you exactly what the New Revised Standard Version says. This is the opening sentence of Mark's uh, gospel. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Uh, that is an extraordinary first sentence. He is not giving us the history of Rabbi Jesus from Galilee. He is not talking about the Nazarene. He is not even talking about uh, Jesus becoming the fulfillment of the Jewish expectation of Messiah. He is using what, by the time Mark was writing it, had become the clear terms that Jesus was understood after, you know, 50, maybe 60 years of reflection uh, after Jesus' death uh, to uh, comprehend what they had experienced. And uh, what that came down to is that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of God. Uh, and today, let's just look at the term Christ. Um, it, of course, means anointed one. But uh, it's, my, it's, it's what I want to get across is that it was an extraordinary term that meant far more than just a title like, uh, say, uh, King David would have had uh, by being anointed king of Israel or Cyrus might have had by... Uh, being the Messiah who rescued uh, the Jewish people from captivity in Babylon and permitted them to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. Uh, we have to understand that, that the first generation of Christians was proclaiming something about Jesus that was quite cosmic. And this is extraordinary given the fact that first century people had, by our standards, a very limited comprehension of cosmic uh, significance and importance. Nevertheless, it is right there. This is a, a series of phrases that I've used for a very long time. Uh, and I started using it because it seems to me that a great many Western Christians are very interested in the resurrection of Jesus, as of course we should be but that the emphasis is on the power of God that was uh, signified in the resurrection of Jesus, which we have to understand is different from the resurrection of Lazarus, say, uh, or the resuscitation of the young woman that Peter was able to uh, perform uh, later. So either miracles done by Jesus beforehand or miracles done by his disciples afterwards, whatever the New Testament is writing about uh, these miracles providing a new uh, set of, a new liveliness in these people's lives, they are meaning something completely different about resurrection. And it has to do with the power of God working in our world. And, and what I've noticed is that a lot of Western Christians, and uh, this is true for all of us, can find, kind of fall into the trap of uh, looking for that power in our lives. After all, Western culture has been very interested in power, 
uh, now for generations. Uh, uh, many people would say it began in Holland when they um, uh, were able to capture wind power in those windmills in order to help uh, pump water back uh, out into the ocean from their lowlands. And that got changed to, you know, sail power and coal power and eventually the internal combustion engine and now jet power and nuclear power and hopefully uh, one day uh, cold fusion power. We've been very interested in power at all levels. Uh, basic power, political power, personal power. Uh, we love power and, and that's I think emerges out of this idea of the power of the resurrection. So as kind of an antidote to that, not to say it's not true, but as a a balance to that. I have always uh, said for a long time now, you cannot comprehend or embrace the, the meaning of the resurrection unless you're willing to embrace uh, the uh, experience and meaning of Good Friday. You, you have to understand that for Jesus, and, and in a future um, episode of this series, we're going to talk about this, that Good Friday and Easter Sunday are actually literally two sides of the same coin, and it's about sacrifice uh, and transcendence. Uh, but at any rate, uh, you cannot understand resurrection without understanding crucifixion. You cannot understand crucifixion without understanding the entire mission and ministry of Jesus, his entire lifelong. You cannot comprehend uh, the mission and, and ministry of Jesus uh, without comprehending his incarnation. Uh, and you cannot comprehend the incarnation of Jesus without comprehending what John tries to get across to us in the first chapter of his gospel, the cosmic truth of the living word of God emerging at the very beginning of time and space, what we today call Big Bang. Indeed, Richard Rohr makes this clear in one of his books uh, in which he's also trying to get us to understand Christ. Uh, he begins at the other end from me uh, and he talks about this incarnation that, that we tend to think of Jesus being incarnated or the living word of God incarnated at the moment the angel Gabriel came to Mary or at his nativity in Bethlehem. But in fact, the living word of God became incarnate at Big Bang, at the beginning of the cosmos itself, and has been vibrantly alive so that, as Richard Rohr puts it, Jesus of Nazareth, who is the Christ, is a new manifestation of that in what he calls a Christ-soaked cosmos. In other words, Jesus was entering into Christ, uh, entering as Christ into a world that was already vibrating with Christness. It's this cosmic understanding that I think is so important for us to get to in the 21st century. Uh, we, we can no longer simply be prosaic about uh, who Jesus is and how Jesus works and what Jesus does. We certainly can no longer simply be denominational about how we authoritatively pass Jesus on, whether it's by sacraments or our interpretation of scripture or the potency of our clergy uh, or the value of our service to the world around us, None, or how morally good we are. Uh, those things are all valid and important and, and essential to the uh, living out of the Christian religious life. But our commitment has to be, as it was in the first century among the people who knew Jesus best, our commitment must be to a cosmic Christ who we can know within our own selves, that our deep self, our soul, speaks the voice of Christness that began not only with Mary and Mary and Joseph raising him in Nazareth, but began when the entire cosmos burst forth. The rhythm of the relationship between the love of God for creation that we saw in Jesus Christ is the rhythm of creation itself, the love of God and the gift of the living word of God into that creation 
uh, from its very foundations. We are rooted in a world in which Christ uh, elevates, um, names, heals, supports, nourishes all, not only of human life, all of life on this planet, not only life on this planet, but the entire universe as we understand it. Christness is there. And yet Jesus Christ was able to live it in his one life. And perhaps more extraordinarily, so were his disciples. Uh, so we will explore a little bit more of that because that is the commitment that the authors of the New Testament are making and they are testifying to that and they are confident that Jesus has passed this on to every generation of people who open their hearts, minds, arms and the fullness of their bodies uh, and, and all that they are to the possibility of Christ within us. Uh, so there's something to ponder for the week, and we'll be back next Monday. Thanks for listening.